This program is presented by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Opioid overdoses continue to increase in the United States. This epidemic is not limited to any age, sex, or geographic area. In 2017, the rate of overdose was 30% higher than the previous year. People who've had an overdose are likely to have another. So when they're seen in an emergency department, it's an opportunity for prevention. Emergency departments can link these patients to treatment and referral services. Additionally, they can provide patients with naloxone, a life-saving drug that could reverse the effects of a future overdose. This fast-moving epidemic doesn't stay within state or county lines. It will take emergency departments, health departments, mental health and treatment providers, law enforcement, and communities, all working together to get people the help they need and prevent opioid overdose and death. To learn more, visit cdc.gov slash vital signs. For the most accurate health information, visit cdc.gov or call 1-800-CDC-INFO. The opioid crisis began in rural America, and in the beginning, most of those who were overdosing were white. Since, the crisis has spread to urban areas, and it's now affecting African-American communities in cities across the country, including Washington, D.C. Marisa Peñalosa reports. About a dozen patients sit in the lobby of the Medical Home Development Group, a private clinic specializing in drug addiction. It's on a busy street in northeast Washington, and even on the second floor you hear ambulances go by. Dr. Edwin Chapman says that often they stop right outside. We've had overdoses right under the building, right next door to the building. It's an epidemic. We feel like we have a fire underneath us because African Americans are dying every day. Dr. Melissa Clark works with Dr. Chapman. According to the Office of the Medical Examiner in Washington, D.C., opioid deaths among black men between the ages of 40 and 69 have soared in recent years. And one of the reasons is fentanyl, a powerful synthetic opioid that is often laced in heroin and other drugs, says Dr. Clark. People who've even been lifelong heroin users are dying because they don't understand how to titrate those doses. That's part of the challenge, she says. And though it's always been hard for addicts to know the strength of street drugs, fentanyl is even more dangerous. It's a recent Saturday morning. A crowd of mostly health professionals and a handful of patients gather at Dr. Chapman's clinic to talk about this crisis. He introduces his guests to one another. This is Dr. Vincent Jones. This is Dr. Larry Daniel. Dr. Chapman has been practicing medicine for close to 40 years in Washington, and for 12 years he ran the methadone clinic at the D.C. General Hospital. Those patients were very segregated from the rest of the community, and only their substance abuse was treated. That experience taught him many lessons, including the need to address his patients' overall health, not just their addiction, he says. I'm always asked, why do you treat these folks? You know, aren't you afraid? He says he sees drug addiction like any other chronic disease and treats a full load of patients with Suboxone, medication that keeps his patients' relentless cravings in check. Larry Bing is one of his patients. Good morning. I'm 64. I'm an addict. In spite of being on Suboxone and being in therapy, every day ain't a good day for me. Mr. Bing is tall and handsome. He started using when he was 15, and he's tried to quit drugs several times before with methadone, a more conventional treatment offered by the D.C. government. But he relapsed four times. Bing and his wife, Evelyn, have been married for 22 years. I don't think we as African Americans are getting the best resources. As the opioid crisis spikes in D.C., she says many in her community are desperate for help. I would like to see more Dr. Chapman's, drugs off the street, crime stop, more schools, more programs to educate on what drugs do to people. It's going to be what we do at the grassroots level, on the ground, more so than what the federal government is doing. This is very urgent. He's passionate about his work, and at 71, Dr. Edwin Chapman isn't thinking about retirement. Not when my city is right in the middle of a raging epidemic, he says. Marisa Peñalosa, NPR News, 
Washington. Opioid crisis is just getting worse. The number of Americans turning up in emergency rooms suffering from opioid overdoses has risen sharply in recent years. According to new federal data, as the size and scope of a devastating public health crisis evolves in many ways, officials say it is difficult to combat. Data released this week by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention show emergency room visits for suspected opioid overdoses increased by 30% between July 2016 and September 2017. Rust Belt states have been hardest hit, with emergency rooms visits rising 108% in Wisconsin, 80% in Pennsylvania, and 65% in Illinois. Indiana and Ohio also experienced substantial growth in overdose treatments. While the crisis began in rural America among low-income whites moved into larger urban areas where minority communities now account for the fastest growth among overdoses and deaths. Emergency room visits in large cities rose by 54% over the last year, the CDC data show. We often talk about the opioid epidemic as a singular epidemic, but if you look at it, it's actually two distinct epidemics going on simultaneously, said John Zabel a senior public health scientist at RTI, International, a public health nonprofit. In some states, prescription opioids were driving the epidemic. In other states, illicit opioids are driving the epidemic. In some states, both. Those watching the epidemic unfold say deaths caused by opioid overdoses will rise before they fall, perhaps dramatically. Opioid overdoses killed an estimated 33,000 Americans in 2015, more than half the total number of deaths caused by drug overdoses, according to the latest data made available by the National Institute of Drug Abuse. As recently as 2001, fewer than 10,000 Americans died of opioid overdoses. The number of total drug overdose deaths has more than tripled since the turn of the century. Preliminary figures pegged the number of drug overdose deaths in 2016 as at more than 64,000. Experts say the crisis is metastasizing, opening new fronts for state and local governments. Controls on prescription opioids have succeeded in flattening the once exponential growth of legal opioids, but an influx of illicit opioids has moved into the market to meet demand. The rise in emergency room visits is evidence of an evolving crisis, those experts said. When prescription opioids are less available, illicit opioids like heroin and fentanyl fill demand. The potency of those drugs vary widely, leading to more overdoses by drug users. The ER visits are to be expected because as doctors write for fewer narcotics, the drug dealers are there to pick up the slack, said Rick Blondell, vice chairman for an addiction medicine at the Jacobs School of Medicine and Biomedical Scientists at the University of Buffalo. The number of prescriptions that doctors are willing for op opioids has flattened out after more than a decade of explosive growth. According to a federal and state level data, but those drugs have been replaced by illicit fentanyl, a synthetic opioid manufactured overseas that can be shipped into the United States in a package as small as a regular business envelope. The introduction of the fentanyls have completely changed the situation. We now have deadlier drugs and thus deadlier drug combinations, said Kevin Sebet, a former top official at the National Office of Drug Control Policy under the Obama administration. Fentanyl has exacerbated the crisis in rural America and created one in urban areas, too. The prescription opioids really started in those rural areas, Appalachia, the Rust Belt, the Deep South, and the West. Zibel said, the majority of fentanyl markets are in urban areas. So I think we're seeing the transition into urban areas more because we're seeing the expansion of the illicit side of the epidemic. The Trump administration has had several high level meetings on the opioid epidemic, which the Department of Health and Human Services has called a public health emergency. But skeptics have said few solutions have actually come out of the White House or the Congress. Blondell of the University of Buffalo likened the response to the campaign against tobacco 
companies in the 1990s and early 2000s when the state government sued to win concessions from an industry that had, that had created a public health threat. He said a part of the solution would include getting pharmaceutical manufacturers to spend money to address crisis they in part created. We have to go after the pharmaceutical industry. They made and continue to make drugs way in excess of what we need, whether that's production quotas or taxes or limits on their marketing campaigns, whatever. They knew what they were doing. I think they have to pump up the money to help address the problem. States, counties, cities have filed more than 100 lawsuits against opioid manufacturers, Attorney General Jeff Sessions said last month. The Justice Department would have file a statement of interest in an Ohio case, essentially backing plaintiffs who have sued manufacturers over false and deceptive marketing practices. But those suits address only one front in the crisis. The second, the growing illicit market, is made more difficult as the sources and types of drugs proliferate. We have a lot of sourcing of fentanyl. We have a lot of it coming across the southern border, but we also have a lot of it coming through the post via the internet. There's so much fentanyl and there's so many different players that people are having a hard time adapting to the market. I'm starting really to believe that they're not going to do anything. I'm starting to believe that they want this purge of poor people because most of the people on this stuff are poor. I think they want to purge a lot of poor people and white people especially because they're the ones that can cause the most damage to the country and, and kick up the most ruckus. So I do believe that somebody whispered in Trump's ear not to do anything or to soft shoe this. So he's making a lot of statements, but he's doing no action. Because if he got up on the bully pulpit and said, we're going to help shut down these illegal opioids, he could actually do it. And make the penalty severe for trafficking in it. That's why I think the United States is complicit, complicit in this stuff. The United States government is complicit in this transfer of opioids. And I really don't think they're going to do very much about it until it kind of burns itself out and they don't have any more use for it. Like they've taken enough bodies and it's time to stop. But in the meantime, black folks, stay away from this stuff. Don't sell it. Don't use it. Don't go near it. Because while they won't go after the white guys for dealing this stuff, they will lock your black ass up and throw away the key. And if it's big enough, I wouldn't doubt if they're trying to look for the death penalty on some of these folks. Because uh, DJ Trump already said that uh, drug dealers that deal this kind of stuff should be shot. It is what it is. Word to the wise. If you're on it, get off of it. If you think about getting getting on it, don't. If you think about selling it, don't or be very, very careful because you're hurting white people this time and they don't take kindly to black folks hurting white people. But that is the country that we live in. So anyway, I'm going to finish this up. This is BGS out and I'll see you guys on the next one.